I'm Pat Matthews, Associate Dean in University College, and welcome to the second talk in our Master of Liberal Arts uh, lecture series. Before we begin, I'd like to take a, a moment to acknowledge that we are in the traditional homelands of Native people. We pay respect to elders, both past and present, and we thank them for their hospitality. The Master of Liberal Arts lecture series addresses a theme from multiple perspectives in the hopes that hearing from diverse points of view will provide insights and promote discussion beyond the sum of the individual talks. Our theme this year is transition, the process of moving from one state to another, a process that can reveal insights not recognized in the ordinary fixed states that we take for granted. Last week, we heard from Jonathan Lassos about the transitions occurring in the natural world and the efforts of the Living Earth Collaborative to reverse the loss of diversity of species. Our speaking, speaker this morning shines a light on transitions in urban environments. It's my honor to introduce Tim Portlock. Tim Portlock is Associate Professor of Art in the Sam Fox School. Portlock came to WashU from Hunter College at City University of New York, where he was Associate Professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies. Portlock has also been an artist in residence at the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, 18th Street Arts Center in Santa Monica, the International Center of Photography, and the Abrams Art Center, both in New York. Portlock is the recipient of both a Pew Fellowship in the Arts and the Festival of Murals Prize. Portlock's works have been shown around the world, including exhibitions at the Institute of Contemporary Art at the University of Pennsylvania, the Tate Modern in London, the Los Angeles Center for Digital Art, the Ars Electronica Museum in Linz, Austria, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Professor Portlock's work is of particular interest to us in this series, both because of his transition uh, from traditional painterly media to contemporary digital media, and because of what his work reveals about urban transitions. In her review in Art Blog, Flora Ward made this point in this way. Despite all the technical know-how that goes into producing this work, there is something distinctively painterly about Portlock's approach to image making. And his futuristic landscapes owe a great deal to the golden age of American landscape painting in the 19th century. What separates Portlock's work from the Hudson River, River School's optimism is the art, artist's pragmatic engagement with the difficult issues facing many American cities in the 21st century, such as the growing socioeconomic divide between rich and poor, the housing crisis, and environmental degradation. Additionally, and similarly in art forum, Rachel Ellis Nera writes, Portlock brings the haptic to the surfaces of his laborious computer constructions that reveal the conventions of 19th century American landscape painting. Portlock supplants pastoral anti-black national romance with the luminous post-industrial -post urban worlds and shows American gentrification's deeper roots, emancipation's false promise of freedom. Professor Portlock's talk is entitled The Post-Digital Image. Wow. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I was, yeah, I could do some digging to find some that stuff. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> hello, hello. Okay, I'll just, <clears throat> can you hear me? You can hear me. In the front row? Do I need this? All right, where's the microphone? It's it's it, 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 it. Testing. Testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, testing, 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 testing. Testing. Okay. <clears throat> I'm kind of shouting. So it's okay. How's that? All right. Thank you very much again for that very lovely introduction. I am very impressed that you were able to find some of those things because you had to dig deep. I just repeated what I said. 
Um, so thank you for coming at 11 o'clock on Saturday. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about my work for that I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, <clears throat> I've been, I'm, I'm actually trained as a painter, but 10 years ago, I uh, transitioned 100% into making art with digital tools. Um, so uh, these are kind of the first set of images that I'm about to show you that uh, combine my interest in historical American landscape painting and also contemporary digital tools. Um, so, uh, I made this image around, uh, 2007, I had just relocated to Philadelphia from New York City, and I had been moving around to different cities leading up to that point, so I feel like I became kind of a connoisseur of what was distinctive about different cities. And, um, I knew from my experience that over time I would become used to whatever was distinctive about Philadelphia. It's like the thing that stands out to you in the beginning eventually fades into the background. So one of the first things that really stood out to me about Philadelphia was the number of empty and abandoned buildings. Uh, the number that was being uh, floated by journalists um, na on national public radio and newspapers in, in Philadelphia was that there was 40,000 empty and abandoned buildings and lots in a city of about a million and a half, uh, 1.75 million. So uh, the uh, derelict buildings were just a very common, visible aspect of, of life in Philadelphia. So coming from New York, where you didn't really see that stuff anymore, um, it was something that I immediately picked up on. And I tried to engage my neighbors in discussions about what their thoughts were. It wasn't that I was advocating for any kind of like outcome from the conversation. I was just literally curious about how they rationalize these things that were just constantly in the environment that they navigated on a day-to-day -day basis. And so while the, these were things that people were somewhat conscious of, um, they had sort of figured out a way to not see them at the same time. So these initial images were me sort of memorializing my, what I was seeing as a kind of transplant to Philadelphia, or uh, some people in Philadelphia refer to me as an implant. Um, okay, I'm actually going to sit down because the keyboard is kind of far from my arm. Uh, <clears throat> so this is actually not a photograph. This is a, a digitally created uh, image. So not only do I have uh, my formal training is in painting, but also I have another uh, set of credentials where I uh, worked on uh, 3D computer games and virtual reality technology for several years. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm using those same tools that you use to make a 3D computer game to make an image that looks realistic. And so first I want to show you what some of the buildings look like in the neighborhood that I lived in. Um, this is a very typical kind of building in, in, in Philadelphia. It's a row house, like Philadelphia, Baltimore. These are all uh, cities with lots and lots and lots, like the predominantly row houses. And these buildings were within like a 15 block radius of my house. Okay, and so here's a side-by-side -side comparison on the left, on your left, um, you have the realistic image, and then on the right you have the wireframe, which sort of tells you the underlying structure of the objects in the image and also how it was constructed. So my process at this point is that I would ride my bike around my neighborhood and photograph buildings that looked like they were empty or abandoned. 
And I would photograph them from as many angles as was possible. This is like the pre-drone era. Um, so oftentimes I would just photograph the four sides or, or however many sides I could access. And then I would uh, have uh, a, a big pile of uh, images of these empty and abandoned buildings. And then I would just make decisions like which building do I want to convert into a 3D object? And then I would make these 3D models of these buildings, these digital models. And then I would start to configure them into city blocks. So I would make decisions about which building should go next to another building based on aesthetic concerns. And also, um, how do I create meetings? So if you're from Philadelphia and you would look at this image, you might recognize a lot of the buildings in the image, but they're not geographically accurate. I'm taking a lot of creative license with how, where I place them in proximity to each other. So the building on your left is from North Philadelphia, and a lot of the buildings on your right are from West Philadelphia. And the statue in the middle that all these buildings pivot around is completely made up. Like I modeled that from my imagination. The clouds are made from software, they're not photographic. So here's another pastiche image. Um, the first Continental Congress in the United States is in Philadelphia. Um, so certain times of year you'll see class trips there. Um, the, this 300 plus year old set of buildings is in pristine shape. Uh, I recreated buildings from another part of town in a warehouse district that were created in the mid 20th century. In this image, I'm putting these two sets of buildings together because I want to draw your attention to the irony of the 350 plus year old building being in pristine shape and the 50 to 60 year old warehouse building being dilapidated. So these are buildings that represent, in my mind, sort of the, uh, the industrial base that made the economy of Philadelphia about 50 or 60 years ago. So here, another image from that. <clears throat> so I put this in here. Uh, so one of the, the things that I think about a lot is the history of American landscape painting. And I specifically, I'm attracted to Hudson River Valley School of American Landscape Painting. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, I think like the first one is I just really like looking at these images. Um, I like that they have like a spectacle quality to them. They're dramatic they're, or theatrical. Um, and I like looking at an image that moves me through a space. But another thing that I really like about these images is these the people who painted these were the first group of people to think of themselves as American artists. So they literally lived in America when it was transitioning from being not America to being an actual country. And as the first group of artists to call themselves American, like a lot of other people doing all kinds of other things, they were thinking about what does it mean to be this version of an artist? Like, what does it mean to have an identity as an American who makes art? Of course, a lot of their thinking about this involved a lot of the other sort of commonly held ideas that other people had at the time. Um, so as people who are very conscious of this question, uh, <laughs> As people who are very conscious of this question, uh, uh, some of the things that they were thinking about uh, had a lot to do with the idea of manifest destiny. And a lot of that's reflected through their, their imagery. So um, oftentimes what you'll see is um, luminous light coming down from the sky. So the landscape is blessed by God. Oftentimes the landscape is very beautiful, but also at the same time is very uh, feral. 
So uh, just imagine every European country or every Western country has its own landscape tradition, which is meant to communicate a very particular notion of that nation. So French landscapes at the time tend to be very orderly. It was meant to communicate a certain notion of Frenchness. English landscape painting uh, is tied to notions of well, pastoral landscape, or gentlemen farmers, um, very kind of messy, but non-threatening spaces to inhabit. American landscapes tend to be, like I was saying, they're, they're radiant, spectacular, they show that the, the land is blessed by God, but they're also very dangerous places with a lot of resources. And they suggest that if you are rugged enough, a rugged individual, you can actually thrive in these spaces. The other thing that I will point out that I only noticed because I, I did a, I uh, took a vacation uh, with my wife to Australia and New Zealand. I also think there are convent, there, there are a set of visual conventions that a lot of colonial territories had. I think all, another thing that these sets of paintings share with like paintings from Australia and New Zealand is they're also cattle, cattle, cataloging the flora and fauna that is particular to the space. So in some of these uh, landscape images from this time, you'll see like animal in the lower part of the image and then plants in the middle part of the image, things that are specific. So <clears throat> this is an Albert Bierstadt painting and, and, and he sort of represents the extreme part of the uh, Hudson River Valley School. Um, so these notions of Americanness were meant for consumption by Americans and then people outside of America so that they understood how we thought of ourselves. These images read to a lot of people as um, real places. And oftentimes the subject of these paintings were named after real places. So this is Puget Sound. But having visited a lot of the places that some of the artists painted in, as you can see that they took a lot of creative liberty to embed some of these meaning, these uh, notions of Americanness into the landscape. So they're communicating a particular identity as if it's a natural part of the landscape. But Albert, when you look at the paintings of Albert Bierstadt, it's like his images are so over the top. It's a little bit more obvious that he's taking creative liberties. It's like he's, if you're if you're not aware with the America of, of the American landscape at the time, like you think like America is a very dramatic place, but if you are an actual American who inhabits these spaces, you're like, oh, he's just being theatrical. Albert Bierstadt was a German immigrant who, in my opinion, painted images of the Swiss Alps, and then just print just wrote names of American places on the painting. And so he actually would make a lot of money taking these paintings to Europe and just charging people admission fees to come and look at these paintings. And in fact, he act I know for a fact he didn't actually visit a lot of the places that he did. So it's, it's, it's as if the ideas came before the image and not the other way around. Okay, so this back to my own work. So I am making images about contemporary subject matter, but I'm using the conventions of the Hudson River Valley School and American land, traditional landscape painting in general to compare the notions of Americanness with contemporary reality. So oftentimes I have um, prismatic landscape. I have an environment that looks uh, feral in a different way. So all, as I mentioned earlier, all of the buildings in my images are based on real buildings that are empty and abandoned. And part of what I'm trying to do is say, in the city of Philadelphia, 
Oh, actually, Philadelphia is two cities that exist in the same space. One is the inhabited city, and then one is the uninhabited city. And by making these images without the inhabited cities, as a viewer, you are able to be aware of the scale of the uninhabited city. So in a sense, I am also taking creative license to um, show another aspect of life in a contemporary American urban space. So again, if you spend time in Philadelphia, you might recognize that um, the building with the person on top is actually uh, Philadelphia City Hall. Um, the, the actual person on, um, on, on the top of Philadelphia City Hall is a statue of Penn, who uh, Pennsylvania is named after, is a Quaker. He actually wears clothes, but in my version, I put a different person on top. So this is an image that um, is more of a uh, close one-to-one -one relationship with a particular painting from Thomas Cole. And in his, so I'll just go back so we can compare again. So, so I kind of gave a general description of the Hudson River Valley School. I mean, individual artists, contradicted some of those things. Some of those artists um, sort of ran with some of those things I was describing. Thomas Cole was one of the earliest members of the Hudson River Valley School, which actually spanned several decades. And sort of his relationship to the Hudson River Valley School, he actually, I would, I, the way I, could, I would describe him, he was kind of like a early environmentalist, like, he actually had concern about the industrialization of the American landscape, whereas other uh, Hudson River Valley artists looked at the American landscape as a um, collection of resources to be industrialized. So he had the opposite view. And so what this painting, like how this painting is often interpreted is that it's anxiety about the oncoming industrialization of the American landscape. So. Uh, on your left, or on your right, sorry, um, is the landscape that has been tamed by, by human beings. So farming, uh, uh, pre-industrial uh, uh, kind of uh, shops, workshops. And if you get a chance to see this painting in person, you'll see like little wisps, wisps of smoke that represent, you know, manufacturing um, and then on the left, you have the still like a feral landscape, but parts of it are being damaged. So like he's alluding to how that, that human uh, 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 change, uh, how humans are changing the landscape and how that change is spreading. So I was thinking a lot about that image while I was making this. So I made this image in, uh, 2008, and um, so whereas Thomas Cole had anxiety about the oncoming industrialization of the American landscape, I feel like this image is about anxiety about industrial industrialization leaving the American landscape, and all the anxieties that are involved with how society and work and day-to-day -day life is changing in uh, Rust Belt City as a result. And then where Thomas Cole is worried about um, the taming of nature, and the images that I'm creating, I'm showing how nature is beginning to reclaim some of these cities. So um, at the time, the economic, like the people were, the media was talking explicitly about the economic collapse that was happening in 2008. And one of the, the things I was hearing is how um, some cities were just not going to make it unless they figured out a radical new strategy to become viable. Um, so Detroit was kind of like the flagship test case for all these ideas. And one of the things that I was hearing was turning um, some of these former or 
current Rust Belt cities into uh, farmland. So um, experimenting with like, I don't what's called the vertical uh, uh, agriculture, growing, growing things in um, warehouses. And that because of the close proximity to uh, city residents, you'd be able to get food to the residents for much cheaper. But part of me, like, while I thought that was an interesting solution, it was, it was another kind of like ironic thing about 2008. It was like the solution is to go to pre-industrial modes of production and economy. Like that, like we're going to become farmers again to, to, to make things work. Um, so here's another image. Uh, uh, neighborhood gardens are really uh, popular in Philadelphia. Um, in fact, this image is called Garden, and it's based on an actual mural near my house that was a mural about a garden. And again, like if, if you if you see this uh, image in real life, there's like a pack of feral dogs. So that was another kind of weird hallmark of 2008 when um, people would leave their homes due to foreclosure. A lot of times they couldn't afford to. Uh, care for their pets and so they would let let the pets run wild and so for the first time for the first time in the two years i had been living in philadelphia i started to see packs of dogs running around the city at least in the part of the town i lived in again i was thinking about uh the flora and fauna of philadelphia at the time So uh, I actually grew up in Chicago, and I think that um, Chicago is not a, technically I don't think it's like a Rust Belt town, but manufacturing is a big part of the economy. And definitely uh, the industrial landscape I think is pretty familiar to me from living in parts of Chicago. Um, so I think that um, I'm already predisposed to thinking about that as um, a subject for talking about cities. Um, but at the time, right before uh, 2008 became sort of like a nationwide thing, there was discussion about um, uh, cities that were going through a post-industrial phase were the cities that were being affected by the economic collapse. And that cities that had an economic base based on service were going to endure whatever it was we were going through. And, and that this was being proposed as the new economic model for cities going forward in America. And, um, and then a few, like a few months after hearing that, uh, Las Vegas became the home foreclosure capital of the United States. So I decided because of those two reasons, like I needed to um, look at a city that wasn't a post-industrial city, but was also having uh, or generating a large uh, uh, set of empty and abandoned buildings. The other thing that attracted me to, to uh, Las Vegas is that it's been the topic for a number of influential art theorists. So, uh, 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 the book Learning from Las Vegas had a big impact on me as an art student. Um, but it talked about Las Vegas from the perspective of spectacle, of drive, uh, car culture, of a place where you look at things. And then uh, Jean Baudrillard talked about Las Vegas as also a site of spectacle where you didn't actually physically interact with things. So the images are also in part a response to that, like thinking about Las Vegas as image, as opposed to a place where people work and pay bills and actually have a physical relationship to the space that they have to navigate on a day-to-day on -day basis. So again, I'm, I'm 
describing these things using the conventions of 19th century American landscape painting. I was, I mean, one of the things that like struck me was the golf courses in the desert and how they were kind of, uh, you can almost read them as oasis, oasis scenes, that is the plural of oasis. Um, but also as like gardens of Eden in the midst of the desert. One of the things also people ask me about this image is they think this is like the most made up image because the Eiffel Tower and the Statue of Liberty are in like the same proximity. It's like well, if you've been to Las Vegas, that's actually the most real part of this <laughs> image. So uh, this, this is based off of uh, the Blue Angel Motel, which is um, no longer exists. Um, if, if you've been to Las Vegas over a period of time, that old downtown Las Vegas. Um, as a, like a little tangent, um, the, the founder is Zappos, he's a billionaire. He um, he's a, calls himself an urbanist, and he took it upon himself to try and reinvigorate Las Vegas. Um, he wanted to make it a tech hub on par with Silicon Valley. So he went around to all these universities, University of Wisconsin, like all these northern universities, and evangelized how all he needed was to bring younger people with new ideas to Las Vegas. And he actually gave out lots and lots of money to a lot of young people to relocate there and start businesses. So he, so there was like a brief window of time when there were like coffee shops and uh, literature meetups. Like it, it, to me, it seemed like he was trying to recreate the culture of like Brooklyn, <laughs> not necessarily Silicon Valley. So part of this was um, tearing down some of these old, older historic buildings that had been empty and abandoned and replacing them with buildings that were like, I don't know, tech hubs and you know, coffee shop friendly places. Unfortunately, he didn't think they were making enough uh, uh, progress in two years, and so he just pulled out all his cash. So there's all these like young people stuck there, you know, who started like publishing companies or like I don't know, boutique pickle making stores, um, who are still trying to figure out how to uh, keep going with converting Las Vegas. But anyway, that's partially inspired this image because this. There's a famous motel that was torn down to be turned into a te technology park. So uh, I would go to Las Vegas. Uh, part of my process there was uh, I would look at real online real estate sites like Zillow or whatever, um, realtor.com, and you can actually see all the real estate that's for sale or foreclosed on a map. So I would um, just change the filter and see all the home foreclosures, and I would just pick out which ones looked um, the most representative of the kind of images that I wanted to make, and I would drive to them. <clears throat> but to get to Las Vegas, sometimes I would fly to Los Angeles and, and visit relatives and then drive there. And I drove through this. I would oftentimes drive through this place called San Bernardino, California. So like when the process of doing the research on Las Vegas, photographing building, San Bernardino became the home foreclosure capital. So we like moved from Las Vegas west to San Bernardino. And so then I, I made a whole series of images about, about San Bernardino. Um, right around this time I was, um, having a lot of anxiety about um, making art about places that I don't live in. I would like to visit these places, but I don't have the same kind of awareness, obviously, as someone who would live in one of these cities. And in Las Vegas, I tried to get as much sort of local feedback as possible. And the starting point for me there was I uh, developed a relationship with a uh, reporter for Net the National Public Radio affiliate. And so I would like read stuff, I'd go to Las Vegas, and then um, we would have coffee and we would talk about things that she felt were, uh, that I should be aware of, that I should incorporate into my work. And I would also tell her what I had read and see if like these things were actually 
current in the city. So when I got to San Bernardino, I was trying to find um, people that I could connect with, that I could show them what I was doing so that they could say, you know, this is way off, this is exploitive, you need to do something else, or to um, point out things to me that I wasn't seeing. So that's in part how this set of images came about. It's like, these are things that I'm seeing and these are things that people are pointing out to me. And I think the work is starting to be a dialogue between me and these, these other people. So this is a memorial to someone who was killed. Um, I see these a lot in many different cities. So people could leave flowers or alcohol or balloons. Something I see a lot in Southern California and uh, Nevada that I don't see as much in the Midwest is people get paid money to spend signs, get advantage signs. And oftentimes these are for uh, businesses that seem kind of disreputable. So there's like a cash for gold sign in here. And actually that was the name of the show um, that I, uh, premiered this series of images in. So it was really important for me that the first exhibition of this work about San Bernardino happened in San Bernardino. So I was really lucky um, that I um, developed relationships with uh, faculty members in the photo department who had been longtime residents of San Bernardino. Um, and actually, they were street photographers, so they've been photographing San Bernardino for decades. Um, which brings me back to Philadelphia, or uh, actually the town across the river from Philadelphia, which is Camden, New Jersey. So um, Camden, New Jersey at different points has been the poorest city in the United States. Um, I was invited to participate in an exhibition at Rutgers in Camden, New Jersey, or the Rutgers Camden campus. And the, the topic of the exhibition was just Camden, New Jersey. So like Walt Whitman was there. Um, it was, um, uh, it's another post-industrial city, so I'm, I'm going back to uh, like the cities that are perpetually adjusting from having a lot of people working in factories and the culture around that. Um, and Camden had been in decline for a very long time, and uh, uh, it had also been a test bed of different uh, theories about how you revitalize a city. So it actually been declining since like the mid 20th century and some people might actually say earlier than that. But each sort of decade introduced a new kind of solution that was never actually fully implemented. And then there's also a question if these solutions had been fully implemented, would they actually have worked? So like large scale public housing, um, uh, seed money to bring in outside businesses, which they're actually doing again right now. Um, these things had all, all been tried. Um, but the other thing is I, I decided that I really wanted to work much more closely with people who lived in Camden. So um, I actually started off this series of images by interviewing people that either still live in Camden or spend a lot of time living in Camden. And instead of me starting like, looking at Camden and then asking people questions later, I started out just asking them, uh, what are your ideas about this city? And can you tell me a story that encapsulates your idea about what Camden is? Then another question I would try and work into the discussion is like, what do you think, what do you think Camden's gonna be in 20 years? So I think like between those three things, I would get like a lot of information. And the first person I wrote or uh, uh, interviewed was uh, Howard Gillette, who's actually a, 
kind of famous historian. Uh, his, his, one of his most, he wrote a book about like, uh, uh, I think about Yale. He was a student at Yale in the 60s. Um, that got a lot of uh, attention. Um, before that, he wrote a book about the history of Camden, New Jersey. So he was like a good starting point. And his anecdote was um, after Camden was um, the, had been designated as like the poorest city in the United States, um, there were a contingent of people who were actually optimistic that it was going to come back. And he used the example of this liquor store owner who thought there is just no way Camden could go down. The only, only place it could go was up at that point. So he's actually investing in the idea that Camden was going to improve. So he bought this liquor store business. And so on the top floor was just the standard kind of stuff you would get at any liquor store. But what a lot of people didn't know is he actually had a wine cellar. And so Howard Gillette, the historian wanted to be supportive of this. And so he would go there, he would drive from Philadelphia to this liquor store and he'd go into the, like the secret cellar and buy the, the real wine. So that was the anecdote he told me that encapsulated um, Camden for him. And that's, that's what inspired the image. So this is, I'm obviously taking some creative license. Um, but uh, part, of, part of the problem, or economic problems with Camden is also a race problem. Um, so uh, the decline in manufacturing jobs in Camden also coincided with um, immigration and migration of people of color to Camden. So uh, a lot of people who were already resident at Camden associated the two things with the loss of jobs and the influx of newcomers were somehow interrelated. But actually, one of the things that came out of reading Howard's book and talking to him is those two things actually weren't connected. It was just coincidence. Um, but both things actually triggered uh, white flight. And actually, white flight had been going on for a while. Um, but there was a certain moment, there was a protest or a riot, depending on your perspective, that everyone seems to remember is sort of like the definitive moment when white flight just took off. And this image is kind of a reference to that. So I'm, I'm kind of saying, talking about that through metaphor. So um, people were preparing to leave this kind of disaster, and then this event happened, and then they left. And so this, this is also, uh, came out of the same conversation that produced the last image that I had with two different people. This belief that um, uh, investments or subsidizing companies coming into Camden would um, turn it around, bring back jobs, and bring back the people who left 30 years earlier and make it a middle class city again. But the thing I want to reiterate is uh, the, for me, the thing that makes this work different than previous work is I feel like it's. Um, almost like a collaboration that I'm the artist, but I'm also kind of facilitating that it's not me only illustrating what's being told. It's me hearing the stories that people are telling me and then interpreting them. But I think it's important that the people who are involved in this process actually see the work and have the ability to give feedback on it. So this is kind of like the newest thing. I just finished this um, last fall. I have, uh, I have, I'm going to have a show at Cam in May. So this is going to be one of the images in the show. Um, actually, uh, this, this image is not based on any particular city, or maybe it's based on all the cities that I've been traveling to lately. 
So uh, the 10 year anniversary of, of the 2008 collapse was obviously like a year and a half ago. And um, sometimes I'm like really surprised about how different uh, Amer like American city skylines look. Um, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, Los Angeles is starting to have like a downtown. All of these things have changed dramatically in just the last three or four years. So the work um, is is kind of a response to that. And that's that's what I'll say about it. Let me check and see how much time I have. I can show some more stuff. All right, I'm going to show you a couple of animations. Or I'm going to try to. So there's no sound. So I'm using the exact same technology, but instead of using it to make still images, I'm making it, using it to make moving images. This is four minutes.
And I'm going to bring the microphone around. Where do the aesthetic decisions fit into your structure? Well, there's a couple of different places. I would say the main one is when I decide about what buildings go together. So, um, like I was saying earlier um, in the talk, if you look at the places where the buildings come from and look where they are in the images, like they come from like really different places. So my images are kind of like a pastiche of the city. And then I'm also sometimes choosing buildings that um, to, to go next to each other to make a particular point. So like, for example, that image at the beginning of my talk where you had the first Continental Congress and then that's across the street from it, you have like these old industrial warehouses. Like those two things are not anywhere close to each other, but I made the choice to put them together because I was trying to communicate something particular about, uh, or draw attention to the irony of how these two sets of buildings are treated very differently and hopefully getting people to think about why. Um, and then the other thing is, just things like lighting, um, atmosphere, choice of like which city, and things like that. Um, well, I'm, for me at least, composition, light, and all that stuff are means to tell the story. So I guess in a sense, the idea comes first and then using all those things, uh, thinking about composition is what enabled me to tell the story or communicate the idea effectively. After, after watching this program here it, it's fabulous as far as I'm concerned, but it seems like it would just be just a, a tremendous program to present to city managers and people who want to make changes and see you can show the before and after, even to, even proposal. I mean, it's it's almost insurmountable. You can do anything you want with this, mm -hmm. and I think city managers and, and would be interested in what is there now and what can be. I agree. <laughs> well, I, so I'm, uh, this is the first time I've been in a institution where there's a lot of architects. So I'm just starting to <laughs> learn. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I feel like, um, I mean, if you went to art school, you went to architecture school, or you went to design school, I think like you have a similar vocabulary. I think it, I, well, the, the analogy I make is like, we all have Latin as our base, but then like they're speaking Italian, I'm speaking Spanish, and the other people are speaking French. So like we can kind of understand each other like pretty well, like just speaking our own language, but then there's like nuances that I'm starting to learn that are specific to architecture. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I, I have, I've spent some time in architecture here since I've gotten here. I've only been here three and a half years. Um, but no, I'm definitely interested in working more with architects. Um, there's a whole discipline called architectural visualization. So like I'm making this work and I'm trying to generate meaning to communicate meaning to people. Or they think architectural visualization is just um, not a, an opinion. It's just trying to help people to understand what the building is going to look like when it's constructed and to sell the building or to reassure the client. Um, uh, have um, you done any work here in St. Louis on any of 
um, any photographs? And also, is there anything here in St. Louis that has um, kind of piqued your um, interest, like any areas? Oh yeah. So when I when I first when I first got here, I I wanted to like having made work about Philadelphia and using it as a way to memorialize sort of my the change in my own conception of the city. I thought, well, I'm going to a new city. This is like another place to do that. Um, <clears throat> and I actually started interviewing people here. Um, not a lot, but like two, three people. I actually started interviewing people in Philadelphia who had grown up here. So I thought they were relying more on their memories of St. Louis. So it was like way more of a conceptual thing than it was an actual thing. Um, one of the things that came up in the process of doing interviews with people who are currently living and the few people who are current, that I talk to currently live in St. Louis, there's still a lot of um, sensitivity about media representation still based off of Ferguson. And, um, and then there was a controversy at the museum. So I realized like, I had to be super careful so that I would feel confident about sharing the results of that with the public. Um, after I do this body of work that I'm working on right now, I, want, I feel like I will know enough where I could somewhat confidently make work about St. Louis and present it in St. Louis. But I just think there's so much, I mean, it's really, there's a lot of uh, danger in making work about places where you're the newcomer or you don't live there. And I want to be completely aware as much as possible of all the pitfalls involved in making work about St. Louis given all the, Okay, so I'll be honest, like when I, I, when I moved here, I did not have a whole lot of popular uh, images of St. Louis to construct an idea about what to expect from St. Louis, other than sort of like the touristy things you expect, like the Arch, um, Washington University. And I moved here a year, maybe less than a year after like Ferguson happened. So that was the the thing that was sort of producing images in my mind. And then uh, I think within the first week of my first year teaching here, someone drove me to Ferguson and I was shocked at how different it was <laughs> from the media images that I saw living in Philadelphia. And it was almost as if people didn't even, like with these paintings, like some people didn't even come to see <laughs> They just described this place that was like fictional or something. Like I, I mean, the first thing I saw when I got to Ferguson was like a wine bar. <laughs> it was a very middle class place. So those are the kinds of things I feel like I need to be more aware of. Are there, are, are there any other artists besides the ones that you mentioned that have influenced your work? Uh, you know, I, I, I went through a period where I was really into like mid 20th century, late 20th century British painting, like Lucian Floyd, uh, Kerry James Marshall was a big, his work was a, from the mid 90s was a big influence on me. Um, I'd say those were like the bigger. After seeing this body of work, it's been wonderful. Thank you for this. Um, and you come to a new place like St. Louis. What are the criteria that govern your choice of domicile? Like, like where I live. Where you live. I think I think I'm like getting old enough where like I'm seriously thinking about crime all the time. So so I like look at I go go on these online Zillow type maps and overlay like amenities. I mean I, I'm like very data driven about about it. It's like 
uh, amenities, crime, and then like, you know, overlapping layers of things. So that, that was basically proximity to a park. I mean, really traditional things. Um, affordability is an issue, but uh, I think I think as someone who is new to St. Louis, there's just uh, certain neighborhoods that are more aesthetically pleasing. You know, like there's a whole uh, the French aesthetic, or in the Mississippi River aesthetic. Like that's all really appealing to me. Like I'm not. Uh, used to it though so like that also determined where I, I live i i grew up in chicago um there's also a lot of cultural overlap with chicago um there's like an urban st louis accent that sounds very similar to an urban chicago accent but um yeah uh, two questions about kind of inter intercontextual issues uh, that last uh, still image before the video of uh, that kind of a hill cut off mountain. Is that uh, any homage to Bruegel's uh, Garden of Earthly Delights? I wasn't thinking about that, but I like that. <laughs> no, I, I that's interesting. Um, the the uh, what I was thinking about was how um, nature is uh, kept or not kept when when things are torn down. Um, I feel like a lot of places where I'm seeing a lot of development. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll just use my my neighborhood and old neighborhood in Philadelphia as an example. Is there people are very um, uh, concerned about all the development going on in my, my neighborhood in Philadelphia. But it seems uh, it's around trees where people like, kind of focus their like energy. So like there's these really ancient uh, trees that are like, you know, five stories tall that were there during the Civil War. And that becomes sort of a, a arguing point that talks about a broader range of concerns. And so that's kind of how that ended up in that image. That prompted another question before the other one I was going to ask. Uh, have you had a chance to talk with Dr. Gerald Early? I believe he, he's a Philadelphia native. No, I haven't. He has a lot of stories, I think, about that. My other question had to do with, uh, at the, the whole beginning, um, it's, uh, well, first the Bierstadt and, and then your digital work. Um, it's kind of the, the tradition of deep fake. Mm -hmm. um, from long ago, mm -hmm. um, just as a descriptive term, yeah. you know, for whatever use of people want to put it to. Right. I mean, I. So this this talk is like, well, the amount of time that was set aside for this talk was an hour and a half. But like, I don't know. If, I'm impressed if anyone talks for an hour and a half. But <clears throat> earlier, I was like, you know what? Maybe I should try it. But one of the things I was going to do was show images. Um, I think there's a lot of concern about images. Like right now, it's deep fake, and like before, it was journalists using or photojournalists using Photoshop to dramatize their images. And I think uh, the reason why there's anxiety about this stuff is the camera. We still have this uh, intuitive sense that cameras are these neutral arbiters or these neutral ways of documenting reality, right? And so if people make changes to that image that was taken by this neutral thing that were lying, and so this is where it gets complicated, right? It's like um, the camera is not never a neutral thing because like, it's almost a cliche at this point. Like you, the photographer, are making choices about where to point the camera, what's included in the image, and what's not. Um, and I was originally when I was thinking about this, I was going to show images of the early Civil War photograph where the photographers would move the dead bodies around to make more aesthetic looking photographs, right? Because they were still trying to um, imitate uh, uh, compositional approaches from painting. Um, but I would argue that painting was the precedent for this, right? It's like people oftentimes look at realistic painting and they think they're looking at um, 
the artist faithfully recording something because that's the function painting had for a very long time. So it's like painting, photography, Photoshop era digital photography, and now deep fakes. This has been going on forever. I think um, this is where like media literacy is like really important. Um, I don't, I don't, I think the artist being honest is important. Um, all of your images are devoid of people. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if you, uh, as you continue your work on different cities and places, would you consider showing people moving through those spaces? Or do you simply want the viewer to try to place him or herself within that space mm -hmm. and move in that space in whatever way the viewer deems mm -hmm. feasible. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the reasons why I don't have, or one of the main reasons why I don't have people in the work is um, so all of these environments or these landscapes are places that uh, are showing different levels of distress, and so um, at least for me personally, I I. I I'm oftentimes critical of images that actually have people that are experiencing distress um, and putting them in like an art gallery kind of context. Um, I don't disagree with showing people suffering in photographs is not something that's important to do because it helps to inform people. But I'm, I'm very much aware that I'm an artist that's putting things in an art gallery and that there is a level of aesthetic consumption that happens in those kinds of environments. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to mix the two things, right? I, I feel like I'm already kind of pushing my luck by showing these buildings that are collapsing. And, and so uh, the term that I don't hear as much anymore, but still like comes up is a term called ruin porn. So that, that was a criticism that was thrown around in the art world, which I think should be. But I, you know, I think you have to really uh, justify why you think you should show things that um, are negative, but that also people derive aesthetic pleasure from. So <clears throat> that's why I'm always thinking, like, how can I make this image, but not in an exploitive way? Now, in terms of like, I really like your comments about how people can look at the image and project themselves into the environment. Because that's exactly what I'm thinking about um, when I'm making the, these, is that um, people like to experience 3D space in a 2D object, right? Like I, I pers that's part of the enjoyment I derive from looking at those old landscape paintings. And I especially like the bigger ones where they're at a scale that's comparable to the size of my body. Like I feel like I could walk under the landscape. So I try to make these images as big as I can. Like this typical size is um, six feet wide by like five feet tall. Um, but that's definitely what you just described is something that I'm very conscious of. Um, and then another thing is um, I've been really uh, starting to develop a set of criteria for uh, construction sites, like critical criteria or aesthetic criteria for construction sites. And I've been um, really paying attention to those banners that they, they put around construction sites that show what the future building will look like. And oftentimes they have people in those images, like really happy um, interacting with the space. And so I've been trying to figure out how to incorporate that into my images. Um, I'm just curious about the software behind all this. Is it, are you just using Photoshop or did you create a, a program? Because it's very complicated. 
And um, also, I noticed you know, in the earlier images, there was much more pixelation because the computer-driven software just couldn't handle the yeah. you know, image. Are you happy with the changes that have come to feature images more recently are much more are much crisper with clean mm -hmm. lines and, and that sort of thing? Uh, so I, I use this software called Maya. I've used I've used a lot of different software, but like the one that I've used the most consistently is called Maya, and it's um, it's like a, it's the primary tool used in the, in the visual effects industry for film. So like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and all that stuff. Like that's how they make things like using these tools, and it's ridiculously labor intensive. Um, it, I really, really, it's a tool that's made for a team of people to use, but, um, you know, I can't hire a team of people. I'm my own, you know, army of one or whatever. Um, but one of the things that I think about a lot is like how these images will age. And that's where I think, um, having a particular kind of, um, viewpoint is something that will help these images to not look dated so like one of the like i used to work a lot with uh modifying computer games like that used to be um i used to make art by buying computer games taking the content out and putting my own content in and so one of the things that i've noticed over the years is that every like every two years there's like some new game that like redefines what realism is right and then like you look at games from 10 years ago and they look nothing they don't look real and so that's where it's like my own aesthetic vision and the questions that i'm asking or things that i'm trying to communicate become more important like it's the because that's the the visual stuff will just look like something of its time um so i'm hoping that this is something as formal as like the compositions that i arrange will still be effective so yeah, the work is more pixelated in the past. Your uh, reference at the very beginning to the Hudson Valley School and the uh, attempt by artists to uh, generate a brand, if you would, of the rugged individualism that was um, um, <clears throat> present in the United States and the work that you do as you persuade and dissuade, um, do you have an end game, if you would, uh, a subconscious rebranding of the United States given um, our history and uh, what has been built and what has been rearranged? That's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I could tell you who I'm like voting for. Uh, I mean, I do, I do. Um, definitely. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to like name presidential candidates or anything like that. Um, let's see. I was wondering what what classes are you teaching here and what kind of reactions are you getting from your students to your work or to your philosophies and, and your vision? Well, right now I'm, I'm the chair of the undergrad studio art program. Uh, so I'm, I'm just teaching one class a semester and I teach foundations. So I teach, you know, freshmen how to use software to make creatively, how to use software to, to be creative. Um, I think basically I'm trying, I'm just trying to demystify it for them that it's not, um, I feel like, uh, I teach uh, people who are choosing between going into design or going into studio art. And I think that, um, there's a tendency for people who, you know, coming straight out of high school to have a very particular notion of what it means to be an artist and what kinds of tools that artists use. And that I'm just trying to my ideal would be that they think more uh, expansively about tools, that technology is not an, a non-art tool that only designers use. Um, 
And I think a lot, from the time that I've been here, I've just seen a lot of students, they do kind of open up to using technology on their own, but I want to accelerate that uh, process. Um, I, I'm actually, uh, I really enjoy doing reviews in architecture because I feel like there is sort of a natural comfort level with technology. I feel like architecture is always incorporating new technology. So there's not um, the same kind of uh, mystification around technology that I think I kind of feel in my like home department. Um, so we get to the discussion about like, what's the idea? Um, how are you taking advantage of the processes of that, that, that this new technology enabled? Um, I, I, I have taught a few classes on this thing called projection mapping. Um, so another kind of like thing I do periodically is I make animations like the one you showed and I project them on the sides of buildings. And um, I used to be a muralist in my 20s and I really like the idea of making art that's um, communicating to a broad public. So I'm making art that I know is going to go in a, in, a, in a gallery space or a museum or, or whatever. So it's a particular kind of uh, viewer who's going into those spaces where everyone's going to see what I make that goes on the side of a building. So I've, I've taught classes that have tried to get students to think about the public in the broadest possible way. And then also um, in tandem with that, like how does technology enable that? Or what's, can you tell me what the building is in Terra Grove has the uh, Wow. <laughs> oh wow i have to read about that that's really interesting um wow <laughs> uh i don't i don't i've been i don't know that i haven't heard of that before that's something i'm i would be interested in looking into um there there um, there, there is a tradition in Western image making that um, came out of um, people thinking about democracy and republicanism, of citing Greek ruins and Roman ruins as a way of sort of saying that our democratic society is a continuation that comes or is in, in that lineage. Um, and so that's what I thought you were kind of referring to, but definitely. That's something I also think about is um, kind of the history of ruins. Like I could almost say, you could almost say there's like different genres of ruins, right? Like I'm, there's like the genre of like the falling empire. So uh, Thomas Coles made early paintings of uh, a series of empires like growing and then crashing. And so that's a warning. And then there's that other thing that I was, I was describing, right? It's like, um, after the French Revolution, people were like Piranesi, for instance, was incorporating uh, images of ruined Greek architecture as a way of saying like, we are democratic too. Um, Can I have one more round of applause for our speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.